A twist on the tale of the discoveries of Columbus, Copernicus, Bra, Kepler, and Galileo. The thoughts that changed the world, and the world that changed the thoughts. This is part four and final. The first part is Columbus, the second is Copernicus, the third is Bra and Kepler, and this one is Galileo, and a little surprise at the end. If you haven't watched the other parts, please go to my YouTube channel and enjoy this. Thank you. So when I mentioned Columbus as an explorer of the unknown, he took calculated risks to go beyond the expected. Copernicus used science to understand the world, but he did calculations, he used Im imaginations to simplify a complex model, but at the end his strong Catholic principles prevailed in saying this is all theoretical. Tycho Brahe actually, with very painstaking empirical measurements and accurate measurements, is reconciling the ideas of saying, well, we can have heliocentric and geocentric also, there's no need to uh, not believe that these calculations are real. And then finally, we have Johannes Kepler, who comes with interpretation of the data and reconciling all this data with religion in what today we know is the most accurate way of understanding the movement of the planets. The last individual that I wanted to talk about in this particular video is Galileo Galilei. In the 1600s in Europe, the Bohemian king is the Holy Roman Emperor, Rudolf II, and under his tutelage and patronage, uh, Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler were his uh, royal astronomers in, during this time, and he allowed them to publish, to publish the scientific observations, and actually Kepler was allowed to continue practicing his protestant Protestantism, even uh, when he was working for the Holy Roman Emperor. Galileo Galilei is born in Pisa. His whole life is in Italy, and the tolerance, religious tolerance is less. Uh, there's a lot more influence from the Pope in Rome, and less tolerance for any kind of scientific uh, observation that may be contrary to the teachings of the Church. Galileo enters the University of Pisa to do a medical degree, but a year later, uh, he actually starts looking at a chandelier, and he was inspired to come home, set up two pendulums of equal length, and he had them sweeping, one with a larger sweep than the other. What he saw is that the swing was keeping the time together. It will take a hundred years to have the first clock made based on pendulums and this observation. But he was really not much interested in, in the medical career. He was more interested in mathematics, in uh, geog geography, uh, geometry, and other sciences. This is a quote from uh, Wikipedia uh, that apparently up to this point, uh, uh, his and his father had kept him deliberately away from mathematics since a physician earned a higher income than a mathematician. But fortunately, Galileo's uh, insistence and continued interest in uh, the other sciences allowed him to change careers, and his father allowed that. By 1589, he is the chair of mathematics in Pisa, and between 92 and 60, 1610, he moves to Padua. So again, as I mentioned, he really stays basically in the in Italy, and he has a lot of different observations. I mean, he was a very complete scientific individual. He has a lot of publications, but I'd like to focus on his observations in the astronomy field. At this time, uh, the Copernican heliocentrism was uh, understood. It was not only a known, uh, but also I want to mention that Ugo Boncompagni, who had been a cardinal and was made uh, by most of us, we know him as Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. 
And the reason why we know him is that he used the Copernican system to reform the Julian calendar into what we now use as the Gregorian calendar. And he did this in 1582. Uh, Countries were actually slow in adapting this Gregorian uh, calendar, but it was under this pope that the learnings and teachings and observations of Copernicus allowed him to reform a calendar. So the the uh, idea that Copernicus was not known, that nobody read his book, and that nobody knew about this, uh, you know, uh, heliocentrism is not completely true, and there's plenty of evidence that it was known. So what was happening in the 1600s was a controversy over the heliocentric systems versus the Tychonic system that had come a little after the Gregorian calendar had changed. So we know about the Galileo affair, him coming to the Inquisition, and I'd like to just briefly mention the way that I want to put it on what was the Galileo affair? Why do we know about Galileo? And what was so different from Galileo to uh, Copernicus, uh, Bry, and Kepler? So at this time, there's a controversy, as I mentioned, between the heliocentrism and the Tychonic system. So what is this? The Copernican system of heliocentrism is hypothetical, and it's based on mathematical calculations. The Tychonic system is empirical. It is based on measurements, but in Tycho Brahe combined helio and geocentrism, uh, explaining that the sun and the moon do uh, travel around the world. The rest of the planets are actually around the sun. He combines these two ideas not only based on observations. We all see the sun moving around the earth, and we all see the moon is moving around the earth. So in his calculations and methodical measurements, uh, it actually was supportive of this idea, which was also uh, very deep in religion. He had originally been from a Roman Catholic um, school, and he followed uh, very strong religious ideas. Now then comes Kepler. Kepler was a Lutheran. He moved eventually to work with the Roman Catholic emperor in Prague uh, under Tycho Brahe. And what Kepler did was uh, absolutely fantastic. He has a lot of different publications. He was deeply, deeply religious. And in his mind, God had put a perfect universe and he put all the elements for human beings to make sure that we could interpret them correctly. So in Kepler's idea of heliocentrism, he discards the Tychonic system. He comes back to Copernicus and says, no, 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 the sun is at the center. And actually with his very accurate interpretation of the methodical measurements taken mostly by Tycho and his group, what he does is that he describes the elliptical movements, also the speed of the movement of the celestial bodies around the world. Kepler did achieve a more comprehensive idea of the universe. So he basically comes back to full heliocentrism versus Tychonic system. Now, Galileo supported heliocentrism, and the opposition that he met in, in Italy and among the people that were around him was both scientific and religious. Interestingly, Tycho Brahe was his main opponent in terms of science. What Tycho uh, supported was that if heliocentrism were true, there would be an annual parallax. And let me try to explain what this is. Uh, assume the blue dot is the Earth, the yellow dot is the Sun, and the Earth is moving around the Sun. On the distant right, we see the distant stars. So when we are on the first position, when we look at the star distantly, you just draw a line, and that's the way in the position of the sky that we would be seeing it. 
when the Earth is moving around the Sun and now we are on a, the opposite uh, position in the orbit, when we look at the star, because we pass the point of convergence, optical convergence, the star would look in a different position. And this is what's called the stellar parallax. Uh, this had actually been hypothesized uh, for many, many um, centuries. And Tycho used this argument to say it is not true. And uh, it is interesting that actually the church uh, would encourage uh, scientists to provide scientific evidence of a stellar parallax to demonstrate that uh, the heliocentrism were true. The religious oppositions were based on biblical references, and there were several references that mentioned that the earth does not move and that the sun is the one that moves around the earth. So, you know, it's basically saying um, we do not believe in heliocentrism, and they really said, you know, both from a scientific and a religious positions, Galileo's writings were met with a lot of opposition. In, in 1615, uh, actually, F Father Niccolo Lorini submitted that Galileo's writings on heliocentrism were actually in uh, violation of the Council of Trent. So what is the Council of Trent? In the previous century, uh, around 1545 to 1563, this council met, and among the different discussions that uh, they were having was the issue of interpretation of the Bible. No surprises there. It, it is coming after the Lutheran movement and the Protestant movement in the 1500s of uh, determining if the Bible writings were actually open for interpretation. And hence, you know, when Luther translates to uh, German and to many other languages, uh, the question from the church is, is that allowed? Should you even attempt to translate it and furthermore interpret? The Council of Trent actually decided that, no, uh, the Bible was not open for interpretation. And uh, in 1615, uh, this strong argument was that Galileo's writings were against and in violation of the Council of Trent. And of course, this is dangerous. Uh, Pope Paul V, here painted by Caravaggio, has been actually made famous in history because he is the Pope that started the Inquisition on Galileo. And this Inquisitional Commission uh, declared heliocentrism uh, to be foolish, absurd, but most important, contradicts the sense of the Holy Scripture. So the Galileo affair was really started because of this very strong feeling that he was in violation of the Council of Trent and Pope uh, Paul V declared him to go in contradiction of Holy Scripture. Now, Galileo was a very religious man himself, and I'm sure this probably posed also uh, problems and contradictions within his own way of thinking. Now, in 1623, uh, we have a new pope, and this pope is Maffeo Barberini. He becomes uh, Pope Urban VIII. Now, Maffeo Barberini had been a friend of Galileo. He had been an admirer of him. Uh, apparently, he did have a lot of discussions with Galileo in his own home. And, you know, he actually openly opposed the condemnation of Galileo a decade before. And this encouraged Galileo, after a decade of silence, to start saying, well, maybe I can now explain my position again. So in 1632, Galileo publishes the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. Now, <laughs> he had the authorization not only from the Inquisition, but also papal permission. And he's very, very encouraged. Why? Why? Did he publish this book in this way? And what happened is uh, what is the issue of the controversy. So what he did was basically he wrote in Italian. 
he did not write in Latin anymore. All of the previous uh, papers and publications by Copernicus and Bry and Kepler, they were all in scientific terminology and basically pretty much in Latin. Now, uh, Galileo writes in Italian, in common language, and he writes as a play. It's a four-day discussion among two philosophers and a layman. And it's basically a dialogue. So it reads in a very easy way. Anybody can read it. And who are the characters in his book? So we have Salviati. Salviati argues for the Copernican position. And he basically uses a lot of Galileo's arguments for the Copernican position of heliocentrism in a very, um, very easy way to follow. Sagredo, Sagredo is you and me. Sagredo is the individual who's reading the book. He's an intelligent layman. And he's initially completely neutral. So by the questions that Sagredo is asking, um, Galileo is making us feel like Sagredo uh, with a lot of respect for the reader and acknowledging our intelligence. He's explaining the Copernican position through the words of Salviati. Who is the third individual? Well, the third individual is called Simplicio. And this didn't go very well and uh, actually was very clear why he's called Simplicio. He is a dedicated follower of Ptolemy and Aristotle, and he's presenting the traditional views and the arguments against the Copernican position. And needless to say, in the book, he doesn't come out very well at the end with the arguments at the end Sagredo who is, again, is, is Sagredo is you reading the book, um, is actually saying, well, you know, Salviati is making much better sense. So this is what Galileo did uh, when he was encouraged by saying, well, now Maffeo Barberini is the Pope, and now I have the Inquisition is, you know, I'm protected from the Inquisition. Let's explain to the people what I've been trying to say. He probably went a bit too much because just a year later, Galileo was found to be vehemently suspected of heresy. And of course, his book was placed on the index of forbidden books until 1835. <laughs> so it's like uh, 200 years Galileo's book was forbidden. And, you know, what he really was trying to do is a bit what Kepler did. But, of course, Kepler was Lutheran. He could interpret. He didn't have the Inquisition after him. And he could actually explain things better. But Galileo went really a step further. He wanted to explain it not to the scientific community, but to the world at large, to the layman, to you and to me. And that's why Galileo was so dangerous. So in this talk, I talked about Columbus being the explorer of the unknown. He used new technologies and he used some information, but he really explored and went beyond the expected. Uh, Copernicus is using science to understand the world. Uh, he's using his imagination. It's a hypothetical model, but he's looking to simplify the model. And he's got a very strong Catholic principles. Uh, Tycho Brahe uses empirical, accurate measurements, and he reconciles the data with religion, while Kepler uses the empirical data for accurate interpretation uh, with accurate perspective positions and calculations to come up with his elliptical model of the orbits and the time of uh, travel in the orbit based on the area that is covered. And finally, we have Galileo, whose um, key point here for the astronomical uh, teachings is the focus on the common individual. He writes a book in Italian that reads like a play that's easy to understand. And you and I actually refer to it. We, we can understand it. We are part of it. Uh, he makes us be part of this dialogue. And at the end, uh, end up like Salviati, understanding the principles. 
So I mentioned, you know, let's look at Columbus, the expert of the unknown, using new technologies going beyond, even though he uses uh, knowledge. And what I wanted to do, this is the fun part of the talk, I think, it's to say, was he alone in his world? Well, let's take Leonardo da Vinci, his contemporary. Uh, he also is exploring, he's using new technologies. He likes to look at the world and go beyond, uh, use his imagination based on observation. But he actually is using so many new technologies. We all know that many of his paintings, probably the most famous one, uh, even before his time, uh, they were already uh, being degraded because he did not use the appropriate uh, or the known tested methodology. He was using new methods and he, he met with some criticism because of that. So, you know, I put it to you that Leonardo da Vinci and Columbus are the, um, the uh, result of their times. They are in parallel sort of using the same kind of drive for their respective works. And of course, Leonardo went beyond art and he, he also went on uh, doing a lot of mathematical calculations, anatomy, medicine, etc. And you know, the way I say it is, or, or I see it is a little bit like Columbus. He, he had to understand finances, he had to understand science, he had to understand the new technologies available and geography and be driven by a very strong sense of, uh, you know, discovery and exploration. So of the next people, I talked about Copernicus. He's using science to understand the world. He uses a hypothetical system and his imagination and he's got strong Catholic principles and basically he's simplifying the model. So his contemporary Michelangelo Buonarroti, I wanted to talk a bit how I see parallels between them. So Michelangelo simplifies the models. He's a uh, depicting the David or he's depicting uh, the virgin and child and he's basically just focusing on what he wants to send the message for. Um, he has very strong Catholic uh, influence, of course. Uh, a lot of his work we know is uh, actually funded by the church. Now this virgin, uh, this Madonna of the stairs is the first known work in marble by Michelangelo. He probably was a child or, or, a, or a very young teenager when he did this, when he made this. And he's very consistent uh, across his life. Same as Copernicus. You know, his first writings were, were about 1517. And it's 30 years later that he comes up with a book. But basically the quality of his thinking and the hypothetical calculations were very, very uh, similar. They were substantiated. He didn't actually change. And in the sense of uh, Michelangelo, he matures, but he is already uh, very, uh, very, very strong from the beginning. The David he actually made when he was about in his early 20s. So his style is characterized in architecture, in sculpture, in painting by a very interesting way of simplifying the world. Why do I say that? Well, just take a look and he, you don't see landscapes in there. Uh, Michelangelo is very well characterized. If he's telling a story about an individual, a Sibylla or a prophet uh, or a virgin, he doesn't need to put any landscape in there. In the Laurentian library, his interior is very, very simplified and very strong. By the simplicity, he's sending a very strong message. Even when we see St. Peter's Dome, the simplicity of it uh, betrays the complexity of the building behind it, which in a way is like Copernicus uh, observations. The simplicity of the end of, this, of the model, what we see, the product that they bring to us is much simpler than the very complex calculations they had to do to achieve their work. And, you know, I think that Michelangelo is a good parallel of Copernicus 
they were contemporaries. And in my mind, again, very strong Catholic views in both of them. And they try to simplify the message they send us, even though they work in very complex uh, technology to achieve this very simple message for us. In this talk, the next uh, individual is Tycho Brahe. So what we see is uh, he's using empirical, accurate measurements. He's reconciling the data with religion, but he's basically doing accurate measurements. And that's what he's basically reporting, what he sees from his measurements. Now, in this case, I wanted to choose two painters. Uh, one of them is uh, not only contemporary to Tycho, but he's also uh, from the northern countries, from actually from the Netherlands. And uh, uh, this is, and I'm, I know that I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but this is Peter Bruegel, the Elder. And this is one of the scenes of Peter Bruegel. He's, uh, he's accurate in his proportions, uh, the depiction of this very nice and mellow scene of a coastline. You can see, you know, the peasant uh, is actually doing his work. Uh, the proportions are correctly done and perspectives with the uh, ox, oxen uh, that's uh, pulling the cart. <laughs> There's even uh, the, the town's fool in the back sort of looking up and uh, in, in a better image of this, if you want to look for it. Uh, you can see him. Uh, his face is like a foolish of the, the fool, the, the 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 town's fool, and you know he's like not paying attention to anything that's happening. We've got the the big ship on the harbor. Uh, it's very accurate representation of a you know normal scene for what you had in the Netherlands in the late 1500s, uh, beginning of the 1600s. Now, the name of this painting is The Fall of Icarus. Icarus was the son of Daedalus. Daedalus was a famous architect that constructed the labyrinth for the Minotaur. And Icarus was uh, an apprentice to his father. And they were very well-known architects and builders. And what Icarus decides to build is this wax wings because he wants to reach the sun. Even though his father warns him against it, that it's very dangerous, Icarus does build the wings. And sure enough, he flies towards the sun. And as he's getting closer and closer, his wax wings melt. He falls to the earth and he dies. So what you see there, actually, it's uh, the legs of Icarus who is drowning. Now, put this into con context, and uh, what happened in the Netherlands when Peter Bruegel was painting was that uh, it had been conquered by the Spaniards, and the Spanish Catholics were uh, with the Catholic Inquisition, and at the very end of the 1500s, there were uh, a lot of uh, people burned at the stake because they were Protestant or they didn't follow religion. So in a way, what Peter Bruegel is doing is sort of showing us that just go on with your life, continue doing what you're doing, uh, follow the rules of religion. And, you know, Icarus is, is dying because he wanted to reach the sun and that was not allowed. So it's like, don't, don't pay attention to that, what's happening. Just go on with your life. The next painter that I wanted to mention is Caravaggio, contemporary of Tycho. And what I see in Caravaggio is, again, very precise, accurate measurements. He's providing a different perspective of life. Uh, and he's still, you know, giving us the very strong message of St. Peter uh, being crucified. It's a uh, very much uh, a religious sentiment, but he's also putting, you know, this individual, what, what we see in the left bottom is the bottom of this individual. It's a measurement that's accurate, uh, but, you know, it is sort of not necessarily what people were doing in the past. Caravaggio is making us feel a bit more that we are into the painting and that we can understand the painting with both religious sentiment, but also the layman's point of view of, you know, this is truly the things 
that the way that it would have looked like, the way that it would have happened. When we come to Johannes Kepler, what he's going is interpreting the data, um, looking at accurate perspective and positions. And who did I choose? Uh, Rembrandt. Rembrandt uh, is his contemporary and also, you know, from the Netherlands. But what I wanted to say is, you know, Rembrandt is actually interpreting the data in a much better way with accurate perspective and positions. So when I talked about positions, it's like when Kepler explained that it's elliptical and that the speed of the travel through the orbit is different when they're when the planets are closer to the sun rather than when they're far from the sun the area that they're covering is the same but the speed is different well why did i choose rembrandt and why did i choose uh, what's called the night watch well this is what they were doing contemporary uh, portraits of groups or group of portraits were basically just making sure that everybody had the same size of the face and the faces were basically either looking frontal or slightly three quarters, but both eyes were shown and they were in a very, uh, you know, straight position. This is where Rembrandt is coming from. This is why the Night Watch is so striking. What he does is a group portrait, but People are placed with different perspectives. The most important people. It's easy to see who they are. It's easy to actually see people in the back. Their, their faces are lit up, but with different quality and different kinds of strength. It is said that it's also depending on how much money they paid him. But it's each one of these individuals is actually identified in a medallion that's very hard to see in the middle of the painting at the top, the medallion actually lists everybody who was there. But there's no question about the two individuals in the front being the most important individuals. And also what I see about accurate perspective and positions, the hand coming to the front, to me, uh, it parallels the view of elliptical uh, orbits and no circular orbits. So to me, Rembrandt and Kepler are the result of the contemporary uh, view of the world, and they are reflecting in a way the same one in painting and one in astronomy. The last individual that I talked about was Galileo, and I want to talk about Vermeer. Galileo focuses on the individual, the layman, you and me the common folk. And Vermeer is very well known for doing this. He's depicting not the interior of churches. He's depicting life as uh, you or I could see it. The bricks are falling. Uh, the, the views are strikingly uh, similar to what people were seeing on an everyday basis. He's actually making normal people in a normal everyday, you know, the music uh, class. Uh, it's anybody can relate to that. And of course, you know, the girl with the pearl earring. Who is she? she she's not an aristocrat, yet she's dressed in a very fancy way. Uh, she's drawing us to the painting. The strength of this particular painting is striking because it's making us think what is she doing why does she have that big pearl is she sad is she happy uh, is she sensual is she naive there's a lot of things in this painting that draw the attention and basically with Vermeer that happens a lot you stand in front of his paintings which are very small by the way and and you just you just want to read this painting and he's drawing you to it in a way like Galileo with his dialogue. He's drawing you into the book and into his thinking. And of course, I couldn't end talking about Vermeer without putting his two works on the geographer and the astronomer, um, which actually to me, it's a very nice way of ending this talk and talking about, you know, Vermeer and Galileo and Vermeer's focus on also bringing to the 
normal folk, the works of geography and astronomy. These are all the recommended resources for the four-part uh, talk. Uh, although this is the end of the fourth and final part, I did use all these references for the other three parts. And I really want to thank you because I've learned a lot uh, making this particular talk in four parts. And I hope that you enjoy as much as I did uh, when you watch it. Thank you so much.